Second Chronicles chapter number 12. There was a reporter who was interviewing one time an old man on his 100th birthday. He said, he was asked, what are you most proud of? Well, said the, the elderly man, I don't have an enemy in the world. He said, what a, the, the reporter responded, well, that, that's a beautiful thought. How inspirational. You have no enemies at all. And the centurion went on and said, yep, outlived every last one of them. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as I was reading through this portion of scripture, this, this sector really stuck out to me as it was a, a real lesson in reality for me. That lesson centered on why you and I have enemies. Why we have them. When it comes to enemies, they can be spiritual in nature, of course, and we understand that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We understand that we do have spiritual enemies. Of course, we can have physical enemies. We can have uh, other people that we encounter that are difficult and trying and and uh, can create problems for us. Or we may just have circumstances that inflict loss and damage to our lives, and we would call that a, an enemy of some type. But sometimes we wonder, why do we have these enemies that crop up in our lives? Why do, we, why do they exist? And why don't they ever want to go away? Or they take a while to go away? In our text here, we are going to look at the, a little bit of a, the life of King Rehoboam. Now, if you don't know who King Rehoboam is, he is the son of Solomon, the grandchild, or one of the grandchildren at least, of uh, David. He's kind of the third one in line, or at least as far as the Davidic household goes, to sit upon the throne in Jerusalem. And King Rehoboam, in this section, section of Scripture, has a big problem. There's an enemy he can't overcome until he humbles himself before the Lord. This chapter gave some interesting insights I'd like to try to examine tonight in getting victory over our enemies. And I believe it begins with God getting a victory in us. You'll see what I mean more as we look at this portion tonight. Second Chronicles 12, verse 1, And came to pass when Rehoboam, had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. With 12,000 chariots and threescore thousand horsemen, and the people were without number that came with him out of Egypt, the Lubans, the Sikkims, and the Ethiopians. And he took the fenced cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. Then came Shemaiah the prophet to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I, have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shisha, or, or Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, they shall be his servants, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king's house he took all, he carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made, instead of, of which King Rehoboam made shields of brass and committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard that kept the entrance of the king's house. And when the king entered into the house of the Lord, the guard came and fetched them and brought them again into the guard chamber. And when he had humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him, that he would not destroy him altogether. And also in Judah things went well. So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned, for Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign. And he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. 
and he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Now the acts of Rehoboam, first and last, are they not written in the book of Shemaiah, the prophet, and of Idu, the seer, concerning genealogies? And there were wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And Abijah, his son, reigned in his stead. Let's look at this passage tonight as we talk about a lesson in reality. A lesson in reality. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time we will have tonight in your word. I pray that it would be revealing to us and grant us understanding and wisdom so that we understand the things that are going on around us with enemies that have encroached upon our lives, knowing that you have a plan in them. Help us, Lord God, to grasp these truths in Jesus' name. Amen. To help you understand just what's going on here in Second Chronicles chapter 12, I like to kind of give you a little bit of the backstory that leads up to this chapter. Rehoboam, of course, as I mentioned, was the third king of the house of David to sit upon the throne there in Jerusalem. He was the son of Solomon, of course, Solomon, the son of David, and so forth. So we're about three generations into uh, the Davidic line of kings. He grew up under the rule of Solomon as he was about a year old. When his dad took the kingdom, Solomon would reign for 40 years. And of course, it mentions that Rehoboam in verse 13 was 40 and one years old when he, uh, when he uh, assumed the role as king. So he, all, all his life, he had seen and knew the splendor of his father's kingdom. If you go back to 2 Chronicles chapter number 9, in verse 22, we learn a little bit about Solomon's kingdom. It says here, and the king and King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom, and all the kings of the earth sought his the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom that God had put in his heart. So this is the atmosphere in which Rehoboam grew up in. I mean, everything was going as well as it ever could be. He was living in the richest, most influential kingdom at that time, and his dad was on the throne. So you know, he he had a good. Pretty easy life, uh, to say the least, growing up. He, he, he had a lot going for him. Well, after the death of Solomon, the people crowned Rehoboam king, but they asked if Rehoboam would ease up a little bit on them. Solomon had been a notorious worker. He had built many things, including the temple, his own house, and he expanded the wealth and the, and the prestige of Israel at that time. And they were going uh, full bore, as far as the nation goes. And it, it was kind of evidently, it must have kind of wore out the people a little bit to the point where they come to, to Rehoboam on his coronation day. And in, verse, in chapter 10, verse 3, it says here, And they sent and called him. So Jeroboam and all Israel came and spake to Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude of thy father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us, and we will serve thee. So they're, they're just asking, say, hey, can we just slow things down just a little bit? Just, and they, they use the word even somewhat. All right? Can we just, it's not that we don't want to go forward. It's just been so much and, and, and a lot. And if you could just kind of ease up so that we could go. And what Rehoboam, does it says okay come back in three days I'll give you an answer and uh, and they they take off well Rehoboam goes and consults uh, first off with the men the elderly men that had been with his father Solomon looking for some advice it says in verse number six and King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men that had stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, saying, What counsel give ye to return answer to the people, this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou be kind to his people, and please them, and speak good words to them, they will be uh, thy servants forever. So they give him some good counsel, saying, Yeah, why don't you, why don't you heed what they had to say? If you do right, they're going to serve you. They're, they're going to be right along with you, and everything like that. But that didn't sound very good to, to Rehoboam. Rehoboam didn't like that idea. Because I imagine he probably felt that that made me look weak. So he had some, some buddies, a little bit more his age, not as experienced, not, not uh, as wise as the elderly guys that uh, he had initially sought counsel in. And he, and he went to ask their counsel. 
we see in verse 8. But he forsook the counsel which the old men gave him, and took counsel with the young men that were brought up with him, that stood before him. And he said unto them, What advice give ye that, that we may return answer to this people which have spoken to me, saying, Ease somewhat the yoke that, my, that thy father did put upon us? And the young men that were brought up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou answer the people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make it thou... Uh, somewhat lighter for us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins, for whereas my father put a heavy yoke upon you, I will put more to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Yeah, well, that looks tough. <laughs> the man was pr obviously pretty insecure. And uh, he goes back before the people. They come back after three days, and he says those same things. He should have read the book. Uh, what, what is it? Win Influencing Hearts and Winning People. I can't remember that famous book. <laughs> you know? um, he should have probably read something like that at least. <laughs> Some of you know what that title is. I can't remember it right off the top of my head. Anyways, not a, a smart move. And what ended up happening was they said, what do we have with David, the house of David? Israel, let's go. And what ends up happening is that the kingdom splits into two. You have the northern ten tribes, which would come under the, the rulership of, of a man by the name of Jeroboam. And then you have the southern kingdom of Judah, which also had, had Benjamin attached to it as well. And they split. Now this had been prophesied because, uh, to Solomon, because Solomon had in his latter days latter years, kind of had forsaken the Lord, went and did some things he shouldn't have done. And there was a prophet that said, We're gonna, God's going to split your kingdom, which he does in the days of Rehoboam. But uh, after that, Rehoboam was going to chase them and try to bring them back, but God said, No, don't do that. This is of me. And what Rehoboam ends up doing in chapter number 11 is he begins to, Okay, this is my kingdom, what I got now, I'm going to strengthen it. And 2 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 5, And Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities for defense in Judah. He built even Bethlehem and Etam and Tekoa and Bethsar and Shoku and Adullam and Gath and Marishah and Ziph and Adoram and Lachish and Azka and Zorah and Hijalan and Hebron, which are in Judah and in Benjamin, fenced cities. And he fortified the strongholds and put captains in them and store, and store victuals and of oil and wine. And every several city put shields and spears and made them exceeding strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. So he, he went about really establishing, strengthening what he had. And it says there he made them exceedingly strong. And it's important on, to remember that because we'll come back to that. And during those first three years, things went well. What ended up happening was, in the midst of all this, Jeroboam, not wanting people to, to yearn back for Jerusalem, set up a, a, a form of uh, idol, uh, idol worship up there in northern Israel so people wouldn't go to the temple and get their hearts reconnected back with Judah. And it ended up being a sin that was uh, very destructive to the, the peoples of the northern kingdom that they never really ever recovered from. But uh, as a result, he kicked out the Levitical priesthood, and they found refuge in the southern kingdom. Look at verse 13 of, of chapter 11. And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coasts. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. And he, basically Jeroboam kicked him out of the country. And he ordained him priests for the high places and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice on the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. So basically what you had is you had, you had a mass movement. You had people moving out of northern Israel down to Judah. It was, it was growing. It was, it was getting stronger just because of the sheer numbers. And of course, most importantly, they walked in the way of David and Solomon. In other words, they walked with God. They, everything was right between them and God. And things went very well as Rehoboam led the way here. But somewhere along the way, after those three years, Rehoboam 
evidently began to think a little too highly of himself. He was strong. Everything was working out his way. And it appeared that he got a bit tripped up with that. Because you read in verse 12, or verse 1 of chapter 12, And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with them. Interesting. What did he do? Well, it gets a little bit more, you, you, it's revealed a little bit more in detail in 1 Kings. If you want to flip over there, 1 Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings gives us a little bit more of the detail. 1 and 2 Kings re- reveal kind of the, a lot of the dirt <laughs> of, the, of the kings, where the chronicles focus a lot on the positive accomplishments, if you're, you're reading through that primarily. And we learn here what they began to do. Look at 1 Kings 14, verse 21. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Nema, the Am- an Ammonitess. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they have committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also Sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it goes on, verse 25, And came to pass in the fifth year that King Rehoboam, uh, of King Rehoboam, that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. Of course, we we read on and and we see the similar things that are told us in 2 Chronicles 12. So you see idolatry, gross immorality, all those types of things became very prevalent, a stark opposite of the way they started. And, and they kind of seemed to flip a little bit like a switch. It, it seems if it was three years and then at five years, and, and it, there was about a two-year span, they went from honoring God to living for, their cell, for themselves and their flesh and their lusts and things like that. And what Rehoboam did was he turned his back on God and he lived as he pleased. And the rest of the people followed. And he evidently failed to realize that the reason his grandfather and father had been so prosperous in the past was linked not to their superior abilities as human beings, but that f- the fact that God alone had enabled them to be successful. And that prosperity, their prosperity, if you will, was directly linked to their obedience to the Lord. That's clearly stated in the scriptures. First Chronicles chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. Now therefore, thus, saith thou, thou, thus shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, even from following the sheep, that thou shouldest be ruler over my people Israel. In other words, God said, I promoted you from the sheep herder to the king. And I have been with thee, whithersoever thou hast walked, and have cut off all thine enemies from before thee, and have made thee a name like the name of the great men that are in the earth. Who was responsible for David's success? It was God. It was God, and God's declaring that here in the midst of that. It was God that took him from being a shepherd to a king. It was God that elevated him. It was God that preserved him on his climb to the top. It was all God. Now, when it comes to Solomon, Solomon was the same thing. 2 Chronicles 1.12 mentions, Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee, this is God speaking, and I will give thee riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee, neither shall there any after thee have the like. God says here, I'm the one that's going to give you this wisdom and knowledge, and I'm going to give you the attached riches and wealth as well. And there was a purpose behind it, because it was going to exalt the Lord, which it did for a while, when Solomon was right with God. In fact, the king, you remember seeing in 2 Chronicles chapter 9 where it mentioned that the kings of the earth were seeking the wisdom that what God hath put in his heart. God hath put in there. God did it. The whole point is God was the one that worked in these men's lives in correlation to their obedience to him. Rehoboam missed the memo on that. Rehoboam evidently thought He could get away with what he was doing. But that was far from true. Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
Now in our text, we see God is going to give Rehoboam and Judah a lesson in reality, just like he will with us. And we're going to look at our passage and learn more when it comes to our enemies and how to get the victory we desire over them in this regard as we see first off the enemy. Now in Rehoboam's case, Judah is invaded by this king of Egypt by the name of Shishak. In verse 2, it came to pass that the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. And with him was a very overpowering, a very large overpowering army that Judah could not withstand. And you, you notice and look verse 4, look what it says about, about what they did. And he took the fenced cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. Now remember back in chapter 11, how Rehob, or, yeah, Rehoboam had, uh, he had uh, begun to strengthen himself and he, and he fortified all those cities, he fenced them in, he, he loaded them up with uh, spears and swords and all those things. And the Bible describes them as being exceedingly strong. When I read that and then I came across this verse in the next, just in the next chapter, just a few years later, it's just like, it dawned on me that despite how strong that uh, Rehoboam could make these cities, and he still had a fair amount of wealth from his father's day, yet without the Lord's hand of protection, they failed to provide the security that Rehoboam had hoped for. You see that? In other words, it wasn't the strength of his city that was going to protect him. It was the protective hand of God behind it. And when God pulled that hand of protection, it didn't matter how strong he thought he was. These guys came in and overran it. You know, the Bible does tell us in Psalm 127, verse 1, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep or protect the city, the watchmen will waketh but in vain. It goes to show that no man-made fortification of fortification is invincible. God can tear down any stronghold that man can engineer. Proverbs 21.31 says, The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. And when Rehoboam and Judah decided that they were going to go chase idols and, and live as they please and live after their own lusts, the hedge of God's protection was now lifted off them and they became vulnerable and their strongholds were worthless. You know, we can hedge ourselves up with the best our money can buy or we can try to escape our enemies through various means available to us in order to try to secure ourselves. But without the Lord, we are vulnerable. See, God can muster a big enough enemy to overcome come and overturn the security fences that we erect in life. It just reminds me of how dependent upon God we are, and in order to have God's hedge about us of His protection, His shield, we've got to stay right with Him. That was the problem with these guys. They, they thought they could keep going and, and still experience the blessings of God in, in, their, in their carnal lifestyle, and God said, uh-uh. That's not going to happen. In our text here, Rehoboam, in his pride, forgot God, in essence. He forgot God. And God, through his, these enemies, was going to remind him of that folly with the goal of bringing him to a state of humility and repentance. The Bible teaches us that enemies are one of God's tools to straighten us out. Proverbs 16, 7, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's a sobering thing, isn't it? Do we have some enemies tonight? Maybe they're people. Maybe they're circumstances. But they're there because God's one of the reasons they're there is God is going to use them to work out some things in our life, to engineer the same kind of humility and repentance he was looking to bring in Rehoboam's life. And in this case, it worked. 
as we see, secondly, the encounter. Now, with the enemy threatening Jerusalem, God, well, he sends a preacher, a prophet in this case, but a preacher, with a message. Verse 5. Then came Shemaiah the prophet to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak. Now remember, they're kind of all fenced in. Their back is a bit <laughs> against the wall. All the fenced cities, all the money they had spent, all these strongholds have fallen. And Jerusalem was in the bullseye. It was, in, was right there. And, and they're all huddled together, I'm sure, very stressed. And this Shemaiah said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. It's very revealing here, isn't it? God says, you've, you've turned your back on me. And now I'm just, I'm, the hedge is lifted, and now you're in the hand of this enemy right here. And that was delivered by a by a preacher. By a preacher. I got a question for us. How well do we receive God's message from God's messengers, regardless of who the messenger is? How well do we receive that? How well are we tuned into hearing what God has to say? Because God often uses his messengers to bring us some uncomfortable news at times, doesn't he? say some things that we don't want to hear. You know, if you look in the scriptures, we see people responding in various ways to God's messengers. You know, when Nathan approached David about his sin with Bathsheba and the murder of, of Uriah, and he gave that story and then he said, Thou art the man. How did David respond? Well, he broke in humility, didn't he? Because he knew what Nathan was saying was right and it was true. For months he had, he had lost his joy. He, he knew what he had done was wrong. Actually, it was a very gracious act on God's part to get him to finally break and admit that so that he could find some healing. But David humbled himself. Then you go to the New Testament. And there was a guy by the name of Stephen. Remember him? The Bible expounds him being a man of full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. He was a good man. But he got dragged into that religious council and Acts chapter 7, he begins to preach. Well, at the end of his sermon, he gets a little tough. And how did the group respond? They stoned him to death. They stoned him to death. Because they didn't like what he said. That's, you see, both of them gave God's message. Some people responded positively, some did not. Thankfully, I've never been stoned to death. But I'm sure there's been, I know there's been stones thrown at me behind my back and in the minds of people. I know that to be true. Because sometimes people don't like to hear what God has to say. And it's the old adage, don't shoot the messenger, but that's what often happens. It doesn't matter who the messenger is. I'm just saying, as we as God's people, how well do we receive the message when it's preached? You know, in Proverbs 27, 6, it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You know, sometimes a, a good friend will tell you what you need to hear, right? A bad friend lies to your face. Just, you know, tries to, it says kisses, that speaks of flattery and just telling you what you want to hear. But that doesn't help us all the time, does it? It doesn't. But sometimes a good friend will, will address some things out of care and concern for our well-being. And sometimes we need to hear things for our own well-being that are not always comfortable, but they warn us of the direction we are heading that would ultimately be more destructive. Because Bible messages from time to time will confront areas in our life that aren't, well, let's just put it this way, right with God. How well do we receive that? You know, in 2 
Timothy chapter number 4, if you want to hold your place here in 2 Chronicles, but go to the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Paul, as he's closing out his uh, letter to Timothy, he's about to go uh, to his death. He writes to Timothy his final charge. Verse chapter 4, verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Here he reminds Timothy of the fact that God, there is a judgment day coming for the quick which are the saved and the dead which are the lost. And he goes on and says, preach the word. I don't know how many preachers meetings I've heard preaching on this. Preach the word. Preach and all that kind of stuff you hear from pastors and preachers. But it's a, it's a biblical charge. He says, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. In other words, preach it whether it's popular or not. Notice the next three words, reprove, rebuke, exhort. Reprove and rebuke aren't necessarily the, you know, <laughs> always the, the most positive things as it addresses issues that aren't right. And he says here, and do so with all long suffering and doctrine. Verse 3 is the sad thing. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. In other words, they will not desire to hear what God has to say from his word. Sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. In other words, we are going to find somebody that will tickle our ears and tell us what we want to hear. And what have they done? And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. What happens when we turn our ears away from truth? We are turned unto lies. We're turned unto lies. I just don't like that message. I don't like that message preacher. I don't like, can I ask you a question? If it's truth, then we receive it. We receive it. If it's, you know, if it's untruths, then, then of course we deny it. But, but it's very easy for people to go, oh, I'd rather have something a little bit more middle of the road and something a little bit more conducive to the culture around me and, and more kind of feel good to my flesh. Let me tell you something. The Bible doesn't always feel good to your flesh or mine. It's not going to always feel comfortable when God says, Thus saith the Lord, don't do that. Or don't go there. Or you know what? Though that's labeled Christian, it's not biblically accurate. Right. Well, everybody's doing it. It doesn't matter what everybody's doing. It matters what God says, and that's what settles it. And that's, that's what it comes down to. And sometimes that's not always in the, it's never really been in the majority, really. You know, I was uh, doing some planning today. We're going to go to London for a day with our group going to Paris. And I was, I'm doing some research trying to get, get our day planned a little bit. And I was looking up an area in London called Smithfield. In Smithfield, they had a number of people burned at the stake for their faith in the 1500s. I, I just read through some of those things. And, and it's just like, you know, uh, this watered-down stuff that we see in, in Christianity today makes the, really kind of dispels what those people stood for. You know? Let, let, let's not be the, the weak kind that just wants to go with the flow. Let's be the kind that wants to stand by the stuff because some have paid a much higher price than we ever probably will. And I, and I just think I, I read through some of the, some of the things and, and I was just like, man, what, a, <laughs> what courage some of those people had. And uh, thank God for their faithfulness. But what type of people are we? I believe those who desire truly to do right will respond to Bible messages positively and those who want to do their own thing just simply will not. And they'll find every excuse and every reason to do that. Some of the excuses I've heard of people, it's just unbelievable over the years. It's like, you know, where are you pulling that out of? And, and it's just like, come on, man. Is it, if it's Bible, just go with it. Just go with it. In this case, Rehoboam, well, he had his back against the wall and he listened <laughs> Because verse 6, whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves and they said, 
the Lord is righteous. The Lord is righteous. You know, sometimes God has to work on people's lives to get them to listen. And God has to sometimes put us in pretty tight spots to where we're like, okay, I'm listening. See, God knows how to crank up the heat. And what, and uh, basically, what he's trying to do in this case and in our case is to weed out all that self-will, all that pride, all that stubbornness. We all have a tendency to display. That always leads to negative consequences in life. Revelation 3.19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. This is Jesus Christ speaking. He says, as many as I love, and re- I, I, I will rebuke and chasten. If God didn't rebuke and chasten us and just let us go on as we please in certain things, well, we wouldn't like the end result of that. God sees the end result of certain decisions and certain ways of life and certain, certain positions people take and say, you don't want to do that. And God will get tough with us at times. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be zealous, therefore, and repent. Turn, <laughs> turn from this way. God does that. Thankfully, in this case, it produced what God wanted out of Rehoboam's life. Humility. It says the king humbled themselves. And God specifically notates that in verse 7, when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves. And he goes on, and they were humbled themselves. Uh, they have humbled themselves. It's mentioned three times in those two passages. Humbled. There was no more self-justification. There was no more blame game. There was no more denying the obvious. No more accusing God of wrongdoing or of not being fair. It was just simply this. God, you're right, I'm wrong. God, you're right, I'm wrong. The Lord is righteous, we are not. (laughs) That was the response. The Lord is righteous, we are not. And and that's that's what God's looking for out of our lives, that element of humility. And the enemies are there to bring that and engineer that in the life is some good old-fashioned humility. Because humility puts us on the precipice of grace. Pride robs us of of access to grace. And we need grace if we're going to live the Christian life right. In essence, Rehoboam says, you win God. (laughs) So why is it so hard sometimes for us to do that, though? Why is it so hard for us to say, God, you're right and I'm wrong? Why is it so hard to say, God, okay, I'm going to surrender this area of my life that I've been fighting you over for years? I guess there are a lot of reasons that may exist that would answer that question, but I think it's pretty obvious. Whatever the reason is, none of them are good ones, right? None of them are good ones. Rehoboam, like us, through our enemies, get a lesson in reality. We can't expect to live as we please as God's children and get away with it and expect his blessings to proliferate in our lives. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. You can't live like the devil, especially if you know better. And Rehoboam grew up in Solomon's home. Okay? Rehoboam had access to the to the Chronicles of David. I mean, he was really close. He had no excuse. Okay, there's one thing about ignorance. But there's another thing. When you know better and you choose to do wrong and to do different, because well, I just don't like that. Can I say this? You, you, the, more you, the more you understand, the more you're accountable for. So be mindful. We can't expect God to bless our lives if we in continually, like Rehoboam, decide that we're going to go do our own thing, chase our own gods, live as I please, set my own standards of, of righteousness. No. 
and, and then expect, okay, God, come bless me. Not going to happen. And Rehoboam learned that the hard way. As we see, thirdly, the end game. Now, Rehoboam, he's humbled himself, and, and he states, the Lord is righteous. Okay, you win, Lord. And how does God respond to that? Well, verse 7, And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves. Therefore, I will not destroy them. They were on the precipice of destruction. See, if you keep going with God, eventually you end up getting destroyed. You end up losing a lot. They're going to lose a lot, and we'll talk about that more in a moment. But notice the, what happens when we don't turn which would have happened if they hadn't turned, they would have gotten destroyed. They, would have been this, they were from this grand kingdom down to nothing. But God goes on and says, because they humble themselves, but I will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. See, God recognized the humility and that opened the door for mercy. And God extends mercy. God delights in showing mercy. But he doesn't do it until he gets the product he's looking for. And that product is always humility. It's humility. When we humble ourselves before the Lord, that's when God grants the mercy. That's when the grace starts coming in. All of that stuff. However, sometimes God needs to let us feel the weight of our decisions through the consequences that he still allows look at verse number 8. Nevertheless, they shall be his servants, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took all. Look at that phrase there. He took all. He cleaned them out of their wealth. He carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made, instead of which King Rehoboam made shields of brass. It's like replacing a diamond with a cubic zirconium. Looks pretty, but, you know, not quite the same. And committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard that kept the entrance of the king's house. And when the king entered into the house of the Lord, the, king, the guard came and fetched them, and brought them again into the guard chamber. And when he had humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him, that he would not destroy him altogether. And also in Judah things went well. See, what happened is this wealthy kingdom lost much of its wealth. It mentions these shields of gold. It was a pretty big deal when Solomon made those things. It's, it's brought out in Scripture when Solomon made them and when they lost them. So what, what was so significant about that? It was a symbol of Israel's wealth and power that was now gone. It was gone. Wow. The Lord giveth, and the Lord can certainly take away. Isn't that sobering? The Lord can give, and he can take away. You know, it's been said that we reap more than we sow. You sow to the wind, you will reap the whirlwind Hosea 8 7 though God is merciful he set Rehoboam back extensively because God wanted him to learn a lesson that you don't do this again sometimes people bemoan you know they, they, uh, they get right with God but yet they're still kind of reaping the consequences of past bad choices. And that goes on for a while. Why? Because you always reap more than you sow. Okay? And they'll be moaning, I got right with God. Why isn't things changing right now? You have to remember, it takes time to cut down a bad crop. Some people sow their wild oats and they sow a lot of wild oats. They do a lot of things they shouldn't do that they know better about and even for years... And then they finally get right with God. Okay, things should be better now. Well, you know what? It takes a long time to cut down a bad crop. In some cases, that crop is permanent. Remember Samson, the strong man of the Bible, who uh, let out his secret to Delilah, and she had 
she uh, stabbed him in the back and gave his secret over to the Philistines, who, what, what did they do? They put out his eyes, didn't they? You know, Samson never got his sight back, did he? Now, God was still able to use him there in the end. He ends up in the Hebrews Hall of Faith. But that, that sight never did come back, did it? You know, some, some things are permanent, folks. And that's what, and, and that's what's scary when, when, when you get somebody, especially when they know better, doing things they shouldn't do, thinking that they're either showing God, uh, they're kind of getting at God by their activity, or, they're, or they're, they're, they're thinking that they can get away with it. But as the old saying goes, the chickens always come home to roost. Be sure your sin will find you out. And there are negative consequences that come about from bad decisions, especially ones we know better not to do. And that's why it's good to listen to God's Bible messages that say don't do that. And we say, okay, we better not do that. So that we do not reap those kinds of consequences in life. Because there are some people today, and I'm sure there's people sitting here, you have reaped some bad things because of some bad choices, and it hurts. It hurts. It sets you back in life. Maybe you don't have some things in life because of those bad choices from the past. I'm not here to rub it in your face. I'm just saying this is what can happen. Look what we're at. Rehoboam lost all of his wealth. He was the son of the richest man in the world. And he lost it all. We would say it would be like being Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk's child having full inheritance and losing all those billions. Could you imagine that? That's what happened here. Say, well, what if I'm in a position like that? What you do is you keep sowing good seeds. Because in time, they will replace the bad ones that are sown, and that God can bring good out of bad. Thankfully, he can do that. But that takes some time sometimes. In time, the nation did heal on. It, it moved on. Of course, it's going to exist for quite some time beyond him. Because we see in verse 12, when he humbled himself, uh, God turned, for, turned his wrath away and didn't destroy him. And it says at the end of verse 12, and also in Judah, things went well. It, it, it eventually came back. Abijah, uh, the, Abijah the, the son of Rehoboam, would, would go on and he would be a pretty good king. And then the, the son of Abijah, Asa, would be a pretty good king. And then you'd have Jehoshaphat, who was another pretty good king. You know, it, it came back. But it took time. It took time. And things eventually improved. My prayer tonight is that, that I can warn us as people before we have to face some unnecessary enemies and lose more than we ever would have thought or wanted. Because that's what Rehoboam ended up experiencing. We look at Rehoboam's life and it seems like he was, he is, he was kind of a bit up and down spiritually. There was a time he was doing well, but then there was a time he was not really doing well at all. There's a lot of up and down, up and down. And there are some Christians like that. You know, they're on the top side for one, for one week, and then the next three weeks they're down and depressed and hiding and running away from God and doing all this kind of stuff. Why is that? Because that's a lot like Rehoboam. I think verse 14 explains it to us. And I thought about this as I was preparing this, and I, I had read across it. And it, kind of came, it just kind of stood out to me. Speaking of Rehoboam, and he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. The key word is he prepared not, or key phrase. He didn't prepare his heart. Well, how do you prepare your heart? Well, one of the major things you do, when you draw an eye to God and he will draw an eye to you, you cleanse your hands, you sinners, and you purify your hearts, you double-minded. You know what that means? We need to stay, keep a very short list of offenses against God and others. And if we find ourselves sinning in some capacity that we get that, those things confessed and cleaned up quickly. That we are ruthless with our sin accounts. 
See, what happened is, and this happens in Christian lives, and I've seen too much of this in the 21st century. They get real negligent and get real sloppy with their walk with God. Because they've, in some cases, well, we've been around a long time, and we've kind of gone through, you know what? Solomon had been around a long time too, and he blew it at the end. So just because you've been saved for X amount of years doesn't mean you've arrived. You've got to get home. You've got to finish the course to get your prize, or else you can lose your reward. But he prepared not his heart, which just simply tells me he didn't keep his heart clean with God. He got negligent with sin, and that eventually caused more and more distance between him and God to, to the point he was doing things that he knew was probably wrong. But his distance, he wasn't hearing from God anymore and put him in a position that he wasn't, that, that God had to do what he had to do. These are hard lessons, but these are, this is, these are lessons in, in reality. You can't play games with God. It's, it, we, we need to strive to stay right with him. And anything that separates us between him, us and him, needs to be dealt with and moved out of the life. And that may take tonight some repentance, some humility, and some repentance on our part. Because if we get away from God, the devil has full inroads. And that can be very harmful to us like it was to Rehoboam. May God help us to respond to him positively if there are enemies right now invading the life. Let's take a few moments and stand to our feet as the pianist will come and play. You know, as, a, as I mentioned, as I was reading this, and it really s struck me, because we need to hear from the Lord. And tonight, what has God spoke to your heart about? Maybe there are some, some enemies in life that are really bothering you. They could be from people, circumstances, just oppression of thought. They're, they're enemies. And God's using them to get our attention tonight. The question is, how do we respond to what God has spoken to us about? Rehoboam responded well. He humbled himself and said, God, you're right, I'm not. God, would you... I'm sorry. And he humbled himself. And, and you know what? It cost him. But I tell you, it was a lot better of a cost than losing everything even his own life. It's a hard reality, but it's a, it's a reality that if we stay right with God, you saw in his life that, boy, things just went well. God blessed and God enabled and God gave opportunity. And, and that's what we're all shooting for here today. We want God's blessing. We want God to, to use our lives. We want all that stuff, but we've got to address the things that hinder that from being reality in life. We've got, to, we've got to address those things. We can't get negligent. We can't get mad at, at the preacher. We can't get mad at the, the messenger, whoever it might be. We can't get mad at God because God's right and we're not. We want to be responsive to him. And maybe tonight you've done some things that have set you back in life a lot. And I think everybody has to some degree experienced those setbacks and those, and those losses. But what you can do is just start sowing the good seeds again. And in time and faithfully doing so, God can bring good things again. And he can take that bad seed that was sown, those bad crop, and he can bring good things out of it in the end. That's the kind of God we serve. But it takes us moving forward, doing the right thing. It's hard at first sometimes, but give it time. And find somebody to encourage you and pray and and God will encourage you as well, and he'll help you. But God is looking to, to, dis, to disannul that pride in our lives, to place us under the hand of humility so that he would get all the glory and praise. May God help us today to respond to him. Father, we thank you for this night, this time in the Word of God. I thank you for what it teaches us. And Lord, how sobering it is to think that we can't get away with things in our life, that we, we need to deal with issues. We need to be right with you. 
and that as a result we can be revived. Help us not to fight the, the message, but, but heed the message, just like Rehoboam did in a very difficult time of his life. And Lord, you brought blessing and you returned things. And, and Lord, it's such, a, it's such a good reminder to keep us right with you. We love you tonight. May you get the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your patience tonight. Uh, that, that just really spoke to my heart, and I, I hope that it touched yours. Because some of these people are like, what's going on in my life? Why do I have all these enemies? It's a time to ask questions of ourselves more than a time to ask questions of God. And that's what happens. It's a reality that we all deal with, and I'm trying to help us get out of that as quickly as we can, because nobody likes enemies pounding on their door every day, every hour. So may God help us to do so tonight. This uh, uh, Saturday, we do have outreach at 1030 if you're able to join us for that. And uh, looking forward to a great day in God's house this weekend. So try to invite somebody out with you and be a faithful witness for him. Why don't you come in and close with a word of prayer if you could. Thank you. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, allowing us to come to church freely. Thank you for the nation that we have uh, and that uh, we've been around uh, for 200 plus years and that uh, you've given us these freedoms. Help us to remember that tomorrow and to glorify you. Uh, Help us to um, be close to you and being willing to submit to you when we need to um, and being aware of our faults and not be prideful about them. Help us to have a good rest of the week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.